Thank you very much, and, and thank you to President Borrell and, and Jean-Michel uh, for the invitation to be in this magnificent space. Uh, this is the seventh time since 2009 that Jean-Michel has invited me to come and speak in Florence, and uh, thank you. Uh, I am a member of the world's oldest uh, existing and continuing firm of consulting economists, a firm that arose as it happened to deal with the American gas industry conflicts of the 1950s and 1960s. I have overseen my firm's work with pipelines around the world since the 1980s, whether in North and South America, New Zealand or Australia, Russia or China, Africa or India, and Europe too. What I have learned over those decades has just been published by the University of Chicago Press, entitled The Political Economy of Pipelines, There. It deals with the economics and institutional development of an industry that has long been ignored. It's the first peer-reviewed monograph on the economics of pipelines in over 50 years. There's little that I'll discuss today about the EU's gas problems that is not reflected at length in that book. And uh, Michelle's graduate students are downstairs selling copies, and if anybody's speaking to me after I'm done today, I'll be happy to sign them um, for you. Okay. Will the EU get energy at the right time and at the right place? Will the EU keep every pipeline asset national only? Or would the EU be stronger and more secure if some of its gas industry was regulated at the EU level? These are the questions that I was asked to address. First, markets are volatile. Unless pipelines can be used flexibly to ship gas around a continental market like the EU, they cannot handle fuel market volatility, both in weather-related demand and in supply disruptions without shortages. But pipelines are really no more than big steel tubes. How do you get flexibility to deal with fuel systems in a set of big inanimate steel tubes? There are two ways. The first way is what British Gas did when the UK Monopolies and Mergers Commission in the early 1990s told it to quickly make a competitive market in gas or heads would roll. The company thus devised an expediency called, uh, and the expediency was called entry exit, an abstraction from the pipeline system. That is, to treat a whole pipeline system like a big tank with only one charge for getting in and one charge for getting out. That's how the system works in the UK today. If you want to buy or sell gas, you pay a charge for entry, and you pay another charge for exit. And what goes on in between is not your concern. A monopoly runs the business, and the regulator tells it what to charge, and when and how to add facilities to deal with the fact that entry, exit notwithstanding, actual gas moves at 50 kilometers an hour through the pipeline system, and a bunch of engineers at real control panels direct the gas to where it's needed through real pipelines. Simple enough. On an island, such a, sim such a system may work just fine, and it works enough in the UK. Gas supply rivalry did develop, according to the wishes of the Monopolies and Mergers Commission. The price is lower there than here. But the UK is still an island. To impose entry exit on a continent, with each member state as its own little island and nothing at the EU level available for straightforward contracting across those islands, all you will get in a volatile fuel market is either overbuilding or a pipeline system that cannot handle stress. How could it be otherwise? If you refuse to track where the gas travels at 50 kilometers an hour across a continent, and therefore willfully obscure price signals for what those engineers sitting at those control panels can see moving through the pipeline system with their own eyes. How can you avoid a choice between an overbuilt or an unreliable pipeline system? If security of supply at reasonable social cost is the goal, such expediencies as may be reasonable on islands have no business being applied to continents. David Newberry and I are in complete agreement on this. Now, there's a second way, which is to look upon the pipeline system as not some collection of tanks, 
but as the physical means for providing the right to transport gas from one spot to another at a predictable price based on the cost of the facilities needed to support that right. It is how the U.S. pipeline system is built and leased to shippers today. The U.S. has a continental pipeline system just like yours. We made many, it's just decades older than yours. We made many costly mistakes over the course of a century of building a system of gas pipelines that promote security of supply without excessive capacity and at reasonable cost to consumers. But we have something to show for those mistakes and how we have made corrections over the years. We have a profitable independent pipeline sector. Those pipelines do not buy or sell gas. They only transport the fuel. They live easily with total public transparency of their financial and operational books and records, having no trade secrets in their dealings with each other or with consumers. Every mile of every interstate pipeline in the U.S. Is, has a set of regulated prices. The risks to investors are low, and the returns for the sector are very strong. Just ask your stockbroker. Warren Buffett may be America's most admired investor. A man who claims that he was wired at birth to allocate capital is heavily invested in those pipelines. Other investors are pouring money in. As of 2012, more than 51,000 kilometers of new pipelines were in the planning or construction stages in the United States, 14 times the rate of gas pipeline and planning in the EU, 14 times. Those pipelines have a proven ability to provide security of supply. In 2005, when two giant hurricanes swept across the Gulf states and put our main gas futures point underwater for a week, the pipeline system responded flexibly. Shippers who needed their transport rights less resold them to those shippers who needed them more. The transport sale resale market cleared and the gas market cleared also and returned to normal after about three months. What about gas prices? Over the past year, consumers have paid commodity prices that are about one-third in the U.S. of what you're paying in the EU. That is, over the past year, the 115 million gas consumers in the U.S. have paid prices reflecting just under 100 billion euros, five times the Greek annual budget deficit, more than what Americans would have paid for the same gas. And what is more, as of the end of 2010, the U.S. gas futures market was 865 times the size of the gas futures market for the continental EU on roughly, cons on roughly equivalent consumed volumes. That means that what, the, that what risk transfer mechanisms exist in the U.S. To, to encourage development both in gas use and production don't exist here. Let's recap. The pipeline system. Existing interstate pipelines in the U.S. are hot investments and money is pouring in. 51,500 kilometers versus 3,500 in the EU. The price of gas. Over the past year, EU gas consumers paid about 100 billion, 97 to be exact, more than Americans did for the same amount of gas. Both the gas and electric consumers are overpaying greatly for their energy here. The gas futures market. The US has a robust futures market. The EU has only a highly underdeveloped one. Unconventional gas production. There seems to be plenty of shale gas formations in Europe and in America. And both continents employ high-tech horizontal drilling. But the EU has, has many hundreds of horizontal drilling rigs to get that gas. And Europe has about 15 the last time I looked. Security of supply. The US survived two hurricanes in rapid succession in 2005. Whereas Gazprom's January 2009 shut off of the Ukraine disrupted gas supplies in 20 countries, and caused President Barroso, who spoke last night, to threaten Gazprom with legal action. Does Europe have less gas? No. North America and Europe both have ample gas supplies in them and around them. Does Europe use different pipelines? No, we have the same sort of pipelines. Does Europe have less storage or LNG? No. Europe has more LNG capacity. The problem is the EU regulatory regime and the process that created it. 
Those are the culprits. So let's compare the regulations. The US has evolved a Stradivarius of a pipeline regulatory regime comprising all the varied institutions that permit stable and compensatory profits for pipelines, the highest security of supply, the greatest spur to new technology, and the lowest gas prices for consumers. American legislators and regulators learned from their mistakes and changed course. It is not an easy regime to comprehend, but then neither is the Stradivarius. If you want to see it inside and out and track the century-long institutional history of that regulatory Stradivarius, see my book. What Europe has is the third package, the root of Europe's pipeline problems and thus its gas problems. It forbids transparency along the lines that we have in the States, forbids contracts, lets the pipeline companies dominate the gas trade, and it mandates, incredibly, a UK island-based entry-exit expediency for continental Europe. The core of the third package, and I don't want to be unfair, but it is true, is a restatement of the rules for power markets. Those who wrote the third package had power markets in mind when they wrote the regulations, including pooled transmission grids, like entry exit, independent system operators to handle vertical integration, and they said so. But wires are not pipelines. Electricity, which moves at the speed of light, is not gas that moves at 50 kilometers an hour. Power markets are not extractive fuel markets with the latter's intangible expectations that drive prices. The worst thing that members of my profession have done for the energy consumers of Europe is to assume that the same markets that work for power work for gas. Of course, physical transmission rights are too constraining for power markets, just as David Newberry said this morning. But they're exactly what real gas markets need and are the foundations for the U.S. regulatory Stradivarius that makes its great gas market possible. America never used the models or terminologies of electricity restructuring for its gas industry, but such models and terminologies exist throughout the third package. Those rules were written behind closed doors with the protection of member state companies, not consumers, in mind. The result is a continental gas price linked to the high price of oil and the slowest new pipeline construction on Earth without security of supply. Remedies. How can the EU make better pipeline, better pipeline business, spur more competitive gas production within its own borders, lower gas prices, and enhance security of supply all at the same time? Discard entry exit pricing for Europe's trunk pipelines, even if you keep the model for individual member states. License the available trunk capacity for sale by contract and regulate the contract prices at the EU level. And get the inter-member state trunk pipelines out of the business of selling gas. This would be Title 12 of the EU Treaty at work. Also, do something to create creditworthy buyers who represent the interests of consumers. Europe desperately needs strong gas buyers that are independent of the pipeline sector. European regulators disenfranchised consumers by pursuing the nice sounding but counterproductive initiative of full retail access. An accepted body of economic literature shows that atomizing buyer groups in a heavily regulated business like gas delivery simply gives the upper hand to sellers. So find a way to reconstitute consumer-based pricing pressure groups or European consumers will never get a fair shake in the kind of closed door deals that produced a document that is so contrary to their interest as the third package. Post-war Europe, including Title 12 of the EU Treaty, is much more about empowering the state to look after the interests of consumers than post-war America. But you would never guess that by looking at the third package. It may seem uncharitable for me to be so critical in the space of just 15 minutes about the considerable efforts of those who have designed the EU gas regulations with such hopefulness. But EU consumers are paying 100 billion euros a year more than they should to say nothing of the related excess power prices. Independent homegrown EU producers like Pol Polish gas shale developers have no ready access to gas buyers and no real futures market in which to offload risk. 
and are all captive to a non-transparent, vertically integrated pipeline system that showed in 2009 that it couldn't handle security of supply. Greater public funding of more pipelines, public funding, for EU members in recession and short of public funds is not the answer. The answer is a regulatory regime more mindful of what makes pipelines and gas markets unique, more balanced in the interests of consumers and gas supply businesses, and much more efficient in the use of the impressive, impressive infrastructure you already have. Thank you very much.